Hello and welcome back to Cruising Off Duty. I am Craig. You can barely see me behind all this stuff. <laughs> it's winter time here in Canada, so I'm not on my sailboat, of course, but I brought home a lot of the stuff that makes sailing more enjoyable. Let's face it, we live in an electronic world. We all have phones, cameras are all digital now, We've got iPads, laptops, digital lights, flashlights, headlights, who knows? myriad of things that you could be using on your boat or elsewhere that requires power. So we've got to learn how to harness it, store it, convert it to the how we need it and use it. Now, I just want to say one preface. It's not just boaters that need to know this. If you're an RVer, camper, live in a tiny home off the grid, in a van bound down by the river, or you're a doomsday prepper, you probably need to know this as well because we all need to learn how to create electricity, store electricity, convert electricity so we can use the electricity. And this is what this is all about. If you saw me last year, you saw some of my, uh, my new purchases. And just so you know, everything you see in here has been purchased by me. None of it was given to me as a review product or anything like that. This is completely unbiased. Although I'll put my email down below. If somebody has a competing product and they want me to review it compared to what I already own, uh, just know that I will always do the pros and the cons of every product. I can do the, I'm gonna do the pros and the cons of this new Blue Eddy AC200 Max. I have pros and cons of just about everything. No product is perfect. So if you wanna send something along to me, I'll put my email down below. You can contact me and maybe I can review some more products because I can't keep buying all these things out of my own pocket. I don't have a money tree. So last year, the this Ninja Bat, it's a solar generator. It ran my Bouge RV fridge uh, along with my house battery. This is a lithium iron phosphate 200 amp hour battery. Love it, as I've said in previous episodes. We'll never, ever, ever go back to a lead acid battery. There's just so many more benefits to lithium iron phosphate. and. This solar generator that I had last year is lithium ion, I believe. It's definitely not lithium iron phosphate. It's lithium ion or lithium nickel metal cadmium or whatever it is. Um, this is lithium iron phosphate, just like my house bank battery. And that's one reason I upgraded to this from this. One reason is just this is four times the capacity. This is 2048 watt hours. This is 540 or something like that. So it's about four times as big in terms of capacity. It's also four times as big in terms of an inverter. This is, has a 500 watt inverter. This has a 2200. 2,200 watt inverter uh, with a much higher surge capacity of, I think like 4,800 watts. I will give you all the specs when I run through it. But I just wanted to let you know, with a little one like this, if you were going camping, this would be perfect. Because even if you bought a big 56 quart Bouge RV fridge like I do here, um, this thing can run this for well over 24 hours. Just plug it in at home, get it nice and cold, put all your food in, make sure it's already started cold. You can then plug this into your cigarette adapter in your car drive to your camping site and then once you decide you got to turn your car off you eventually don't want to drain your car battery you would then plug in this bouge rv fridge into your solar generator now let's just talk quickly about solar generators uh, depending on what size you need but they all have the same components it's called a solar generator for a reason unlike a gas generator which i actually own one of those as well i own a 2000 or 2200 watt yamaha gas powered generator that i thought i would use for things like power outages and on my boat for occasionally, you know, on, on the shore, you've got to do some buffing and some waxing and some stuff where you need power tools. And sometimes where they put you is way in the corner of the yard, way away from any sort of power outlets. So I have that solar, uh, sorry, I have that gas generator. But the reality is if you're camping, if you're a boater, any of those things, Gas generators are A, loud. So you're gonna get the stink eye from people if you're anchored near them, running a gas generator out in your cockpit. It's smelly from the fumes. You've gotta bring gasoline, which most sailboats run on diesel. So gasoline is just a totally different type of fuel that you don't need other than for your gas generator. Uh, just so many things, oil changes, maintenance. You gotta winterize it in the winter. It is a pain in the butt. So now that this technology exists, I bought that solar or gas generator probably 15 years ago, and this technology didn't exist back then. But a solar generator does everything that can do and more. So it's called a solar generator because, not because there's any solar panels built onto this, but because you can take either a folding solar panel like this 200 watt Blue Eddy, or this 100 watt AIM Tom, this is the one I had last year on my sailboat. Um, those things can plug directly into these, 
uh, they have an MPPT controller built into them. So it'll take this and efficiently turn it into the just the right amount of amps and volts to charge your battery optimally. And then you obviously have the battery technology. This is lithium iron. This is lithium iron phosphate. This can get about 3,500 cycles from completely dead to completely full and will still have 80% of its lifespan capacity left. So this thing will last you a couple of decades. Probably the technology and batteries and solar generators will advance so much that you'll want to buy a new one well before this one stops working. So I just thought I'd let you know that. My solar generator takes in the solar, converts it into the right amps and volts to charge your batteries, and charges it in this case into a lithium iron phosphate with thousands of life cycles into it, and then converts it with a sine wave inverter. This is, again has a 2200 watt um, inverter, and then you have a whole myriad of ways to, uh, to use it, with the most exciting one for a boat or an RV being you have a 30 amp shore power for a boat or RV plug power for an RV right there, which is something I've, one of the reasons I bought this one over all the other ones. This is 30 amp and it is a legitimate 30 amp. Some other ones have been known to say that they're 30 amp and yet when they actually get tested, they really can only handle about 25 amps or the voltage starts to drop which is not always good if you're running laptops or things that, uh, or, or maybe even a microwave where it needs a consistent, a steady voltage. You don't want something that's fluctuating because it's struggling to keep up. Shore power, it's gonna be a godsend on a boat or an RV. So why don't I clear out this so I can actually show you all the angles of this and all the features of the Blue Eddy AC200 Max coming up next. Okay, so here is the dinosaur, the generator that most people would know when you think of a generator, this is what you think of, gas powered. As I go through a bunch of this stuff, I'll probably do the pros and cons as I'm thinking about it, none of this is scripted. And then at the end, I'll just summarize the pros and cons of uh, this over this. There's so many, I, I probably couldn't mention them off the top of my head right now. Let's just talk about the traditional generator. Obviously gas powered, you got a pull started on mine. Um, it's a 2000 watt, I believe. Yeah, 2000 watt uh, Yamaha. There's Honda's versions similar. Love it, relatively quiet, uh, relatively. <laughs> if you're a boater, you know how sound travels on water. So picture a nice early morning, you know, you wake up, it's been overcast or cloudy the day before, overnight your fridges have been running, your, your house bank has been kind of drained down. You look at the forecast, it's calling for rain or overcast, so you're not gonna get a lot of solar you would want to fire this up just to boost your house battery so you can get on with your day and do some stuff that might take power. This thing, even though you say it's relatively quiet, not that quiet out on the water. Uh, same with campers. If you're in a campsite early morning, you need to top up your house bank. People aren't gonna love you. You're gonna get a lot of stink eye from people. You fire this up. Other thing is it only produces power when it's running. It doesn't store the power for later when you need it. This obviously you can charge this from AC, you can charge it from, from uh, solar panels, you can charge it from your car, you know, you can charge it when you have access to power and then store it uh, for when you really need it. This thing has to be on in order for you to use it. The other thing too is you're probably not gonna fire up a 2000 watt inverter just to charge your iPad, wherever my iPad went, or your phone. You're not gonna do that. It's just a waste of gasoline. So you need to turn it on only when you need a lot of power. If you're in a place where you get brownouts, you get power outages, you're in a place where, you know, hurricanes and things go by and you're iffy about if you're gonna have consistent power or heaven forbid, you know, you're in a war zone like over in Ukraine where your enemy keeps <laughs> firing missiles at your power station and you have power that goes on and off regularly. This, you can charge it when you have power and then when you don't have power, you can use it. This doesn't do that. So you need to turn it on only when you have a lot of things you need to charge or, or power up. You know, you need to get as close as you can to using the full 2000 watts to get the most efficiency for the gas you're gonna be burning and the inconvenience and the fumes and the sound and all that stuff. Theoretically, if I didn't already own this, I would never buy one of these things. Now there is one use case I can think of. If you are in an extended power outage and you have solar, 200 watts in this case, or outside I have 400 watts. If you only sporadically need power and you're not using it during the times where you have power, you could use the solar to top this up for free. 
but 400 watts isn't gonna cut it if you're using it consistently to run fridges, freezers, your furnace for your house to keep it warm, who knows what other things, you're not gonna have enough solar. Now, this can handle 900 watts of solar in the solar input, and you can buy a, talk about it later, a AC to DC converter box, an additional uh, item that can then add another 500 watts of solar if you happen to have two different solar arrays for a total of 1400 watts, which is nice because you can charge this thing in about an hour if you had a full 1400 watts of solar coming in. This uh, has one use case and one use case only. If you have a long power outage, remember I said you need something with a lot of draw. Well, wouldn't it be smart to spire this up to charge this? Right? If you could do the two at once um, charging, you could do 500 watts with this and then solar at the same time. And then on top of that, not only charge this, but then plug in other things that you would want to charge, you know, your laptops, your iPads, your phones, and all that stuff at the same time to kind of get close to the 2000 watt capacity. That is the only use case I can think of. <laughs> if you needed to top up everything at once, you would fire this up for an hour or two, get everything fully charged, and then shut it off. Um, that's the only use case. So, Let's get rid of the dinosaur, and then we'll talk about all the features of this. Okay, let's just go over the overview of its size. It is 17 inches by 15 inches by 11 inches in case dimensions matter to you. If you're an RV or boat and you have a cabinet, you'd like to put this inside, those are the dimensions. It weighs about 63, 64 pounds. Again, a guy like me, I can pick it up fairly easy to load it in and out of my car. Would I wanna walk 100 yards from my car to my boat carrying it? Probably not. You'd probably want to put it in a rolling cart or it does have two handles so if you have one person on each handle you know you can split that to be about 30 pounds each which is doable for a longer walk if you're going camping and you have to park somewhere and walk to a campsite this is definitely movable there is a bigger version this is the ac 200 max there's an ac 300 which is larger dimensions not actually heavier because it doesn't come with a battery built in when you buy it you get a separate um, lithium iron phosphate battery that's 3,000 uh, watt hours instead of 2,000. Again, it becomes two components then. You have the guts of the inverter and the uh, MPPT controller and a lot more stuff here, uh, but that's lighter because there's no battery in it, but then you have to carry a separate battery. I went with this for two main reasons. It's all in one. I'm gonna love the fact that I can use this on my boat as a supplement to my house bank to uh, add capacity, make my life more enjoyable. But also, when I'm done, if I'm going to be away from my boat for a week, I will just take this with me home, and it becomes a home backup for power outages and things like that. The 3000, the AC300, sorry, you have to carry two components home. Clearly, it has more capacity. I think it's a 50 amp um, shore power instead of a 30, but my boat, 30 is plenty, even around your house. Unless you're an RV with a lot of draw, uh, 30 should be fine. Um, if you need more capacity too, this has a B200, I believe is the name of it, B200 battery that's an additional 2048. If you've got the AC300, it comes with one battery and you can buy, uh, I think, additional two. So you can get an additional two batteries for this or additional, I guess, three, counting kind of you get one right away with the uh, AC300. So if you want something with more capacity than this, then that's probably the one you go for. I went for this for all in one. I also went for slightly smaller size, a little bit uh, easier to uh, take to and from the boat. Now, like I said before, 3,500 cycles. And when they call a cycle, it's from completely dead to completely full is considered a cycle. So think about it, you're hardly ever going to drain this right to zero. Um, it won't hurt it if you do, but if you do, then charging it all the way to full is considered one cycle. Think about how many times you're gonna do that. 3,500 times, now if you're only going from 50% up to 100, like it's that sort of what I do around my house. I use this to charge my, uh, my 65 inch LED TV in my family room, along with two bar fridges that are in there. I have them on the same circuit and I have one of those smart plugs that I can tell, um, you know, Alexa, hopefully it doesn't hear me, to turn on that plug or turn off that plug. So at night I shut off the TV so that it doesn't draw, which surprised me. One thing about one of these things is you get to see exactly how many watts everything is using. And there's times where you had no clue. Like what does a 65 inch LED TV actually draw? Well, when it's on, depending if the screen's bright, a bright image, it's like 200 and something watts. Which may not be surprising. To me, it seemed higher than I expected considering it's LED. What surprised me is when you power it off, it's still drawing 48 watts. 
Uh, that threw me off. I did not know that. So now I have all those smart plugs. I just tell it to turn it off when I'm done using the TV. But the bar fridges, of course, are using it all the time. So this is drawing down all night when there's no solar. And then during the day, it's getting solar from my solar panels. And if it's cloudy and I'm not getting enough, I just have a smart, one of the smart plugs connected to this that after hours when electricity is cheap, it charges this back up to 100%. But I almost never let it get below 50%. So if you're going 50% to 100, you'd have 7,000 cycles. And that only brings it down to 80% of its capacity. Not to say this is no longer useful at 80%. It still would be, but you might notice many years down the road when you get there that you don't have the same capacity that you remember having when you first got it. So there you go. Another benefit of uh, lithium iron phosphate, you'll often see life po 4 That's another symbol for lithium iron phosphate is A, you can drain them right down to zero without hurting it. <clears throat> B, it gives you a consistent 13, 13 and a half volts. It's not like a lead acid where it starts at 12.4, whatever, 12.6 when it's full. And as it gets weaker, the voltage keeps dropping. You'll notice that when you're on an old ver inverter, this was the one from my boat and all, it didn't have much of a readout, a little tiny little three digit readout, but you would see the voltage right here all the time. And you could tell if your battery was getting low based on what volts it's at. This thing is like consistent, 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 consistent until it dies off and then at the end it drops off, which is nice, especially for uh, electronics and other things that kind of want to have a consistent um, uh, voltage. Now, this could be considered a pro or a con. It comes with a separate 500 watt AC plug to charge it and that goes into the uh, barrel port on the side here, which I'll show you in a separate B-roll. It's good that it's not built in because this ad would add some weight, but I honestly think if I took all the plastic and the cords off this, the, the guts of this wouldn't add that much weight when you're talking 64 pounds. I would rather they had built this straight in and then you just have a normal like computer plug you would plug into the side of this. But if you were taking it just for a afternoon camping beach day and you wanted to bring this in your car, a um, little less weight, not having this built in is a benefit. The downside is if you get there and you realize you're using more power than you thought you were gonna use and you're running out of power, if you didn't bring this and you obviously didn't bring solar panels with you, you're kind of foobarred. So would have preferred this be built in. Now the AC300 I talked about already, it is built in there, but I think that's because there's no battery built into the main, uh, the main housing. Therefore they had the space and the ability to add a little bit more weight by building this directly in. While I'm thinking about it, the other negative to this is that the fan always runs. Now, I don't know if it's just my, did I get a, a slight lemon? I'm not sure. Write in the comments if you have one of these and you have the same problem. As soon as I turn this on to, to charge it, the fan runs and it's audible. And you think, okay, it's running while it's charging, right? Because the fan is supposed to cool it down. With mine, the fan runs no matter what. Even when this is 100% topped up, I'll come back an hour after it's been topped up for a while, the fan is still running. <laughs> so if you have this in your boat, you know, beside your bed, which is sort of where I'm planning to do it, and you have this plugged in, you're going to have this fan running all night. So you have to remind yourself at a certain point um, to unplug this. <laughs> Otherwise, you're gonna hear that fan, which may or may not be something you wanna hear while you're sleeping. Here's the sound of the AC brick. I'll just shut up for a second so you can hear it. It's, it's noticeable. And that runs nonstop. As soon as you plug it in, even when this thing becomes fully charged, it doesn't matter. It's always making that sound, at least the one I got. Now it supports pass-through charging. So if you're charging it with AC or uh, solar panels, it will actually send the power directly through to what you're desiring out of this and then the excess goes to the battery, which is good. So you can unplug or plug in the power supply while things are going. And if it, you do, it'll just revert to using the battery instead of the pass through charging, but that is uh, there. So there you go. If it's only 500, this is only bringing in 500 watts. If for whatever reason you're using more than 500 watts, then your battery will slowly deplete even though you're plugged into AC power. And again, you can buy that DC enhancer. Uh, it looks like this, but it's gray. <laughs> You can buy that to add extra inputs. So if you are drawing more than 500, you should be able with those two to definitely um, keep up with it. Again, if you have this going and um, solar panel, you should, you should be fine. I mean, unless you're <laughs> 
running a lot of stuff all at once, you should be able to keep up with the capacity. If you are using it heavy like that, you probably should invest in those additional uh, B200 batteries or even the B300 batteries, the bigger batteries that go with the AC300. I should mention that you can use those bigger batteries with this. The footprint's just different. This has a certain footprint that the B200 batteries match perfectly, so you can stack this on top of the batteries and it looks uniform. If you get the AC300 battery versions, the batteries are bigger, therefore this would look smaller on top of those batteries. So just keep that in mind. So inside here is a sine wave 2200 watt inverter, and it actually has a surge capacity of 4800. And a good channel to watch is Hobotech or um, Jasonoid. Those two channels, they get these early, probably even before the, they're sold to the public to review. And at least Hobotech for sure abuses the crap out of them. It's a good channel if you wanna see what can this thing actually do above its rated capacity. He's, again, I wouldn't do it with mine because I paid for mine, <laughs> but he's run these things for, I think he, had, he did uh, 2,600 watts sustained for a while and it never shut down. So it can go more than the 2200. Uh, like it says, it has a surge capacity of 4800 and he did about 2300 watts for five minutes straight just to see if it would shut off after a certain amount of time and it never did. So there you go. It's not like 2200 is its absolute maximum. You can go above that um, for short periods of time. So if you already have a, a fairly heavy draw on there and you forget and then you put a toaster on or something and you kind of boom, go above the 2200 watts, it won't instantly blow up and start <laughs> making smoke and all that stuff. At least based on Jasonoid and uh, Hobotech over kind of abusing it to see how far it would go, it didn't seem to make a difference. At some point, if you do go too far, too far above it for an extended period of time, I guess it'll kind of overheat and it has a be a battery management system and probably heat sensors and it will shut off and give you an error code at some point so it's not invincible you you there is a limit but it seems like for a short period of time you can go substantially above the 2200 watts i'm sure blue eddie wouldn't suggest you do that and i wouldn't do it with one i paid for but those that have gotten them for review have abused the crap out of them and they do work he also <clears throat> tested this 30 amp to make sure it really is 30 amp because there are some competitors that have a 30 amp and he got 32 amps consistent out of this and which means it's more than its rated capacity for an extended period of time so it seems like it can handle more than that while some of the competitors say 30 and they can't do more than 25 before the voltage falls i mentioned that once before but it's worth repeating it just it just kind of shows you that the inverter in here is very substantial uh, which is great. I mean, honestly, I would say this, if you're going to use a car analogy, the Blue Eddy products are built solid. It would be like an Audi, BMW, Lexus type of brand if you're doing a car versus some of the other maybe cheaper for the same size of battery bank, um, maybe more like a, a Kia or whatever, where they're still great. They still do the job. You just might find that certain things are not quite up to what you thought they would do. And from everything I've seen on the Blue Eddy, and that's why I bought this one, it is rock solid and uh, kind of outperforms all its stated specs. So obviously it has four AC plugs. Now this is a North American model. There is a Australian slash European models that have slightly different layout. But for this, you'll see you have four of them and they're 20 amp out output. That's pretty good because, you know, usually AC might be Sometimes you might think there might be 10 amp or 15 amp, but this is full 20. Now they're all labeled on the front here and I'll zoom in with some B-roll just to show it to you. They all have these little rubber covers, which is kind of nice because I can picture this being somebody taking this to their campsite with them and putting it under a, a tent awning or an RV or with an awning and they put it outside because that's where people want to be able to plug things in in between their camping chairs. And then they go for a hike or something and while they're gone it starts to rain you know summertime just rain just comes out of nowhere even if it's not expected if you had this under an awning i wouldn't put it out in the direct rain but in an awning situation where the rain's splashing near it and it's getting a bit of spray on it having these little rubber dust covers they really are solid when you put them in and i pretty much would assume that they would be kind of splash resistant which is nice obviously it's a touch sensitive screen i love it uh, for brightness, I know a few people have complained it's not great in direct sunlight. I just don't think you would leave this in direct sunlight. Why would you? I mean, the ABS, you want to keep it nice looking. You don't want it to start fading. So I wouldn't permanently leave it in the sun. Um, but yeah, I've never really had a problem with the brightness of it. I do have a problem with the information it gives out. If I have to have a pet peeve about the screen, it's not the brightness, it's the lack of one information thing that is crucial. 
Right now you can see I'm charging with the uh, ch charging AC power brick. I actually let this get pretty low. It's at 5%, it's bringing in 464 watts. Very easy to see, 5%. Doesn't tell you how long it's gonna take to charge. And when I'm not charging, if I plug something in, it won't tell me how many hours I have at the current consumption rate before it's dead. That is crucial. I mean, even this Ninja Bat here, which is a very inexpensive, smaller alternative, does the same job, but you know, to a much less extent. It even says how it's using 44 watts to charge my uh, MacBook Pro. Now granted, it's only got a 60 watt out potential. It's so using 44 watts. It says based on it being 77%, I have nine hours of usage. Well, I'll just switch to eight. Eight hours of usage as this watts goes up and down, that hours will change a little bit, but I like to see that. See down here, you just see percent. So if you're using something, if I was, let's just plug this in here. So my same MacBook Pro plugged in, so using 50 watts, so about the same. So I guess my MacBook must not be that dead. It should charge it up to 100 watts. Uh, but you can see 463 watts coming in, 48 watts coming out. Regardless of whether I'm charging or not charging, this only shows you percent. If you touch it, it just shows you your battery status in terms of percent. There's nowhere on here that'll tell you how many hours you have left to charge if it's charging or how many hours you have left to discharge if you're discharging. And even the most basic uh, solar generators these days do that. If you're charging, of course, it's saying 99 because nothing is charging or discharging. Uh, nothing. And that's important because if you're using it and let's say it's at 72% and you walk away and you come back and now it says 58%, you're like, Okay, how many hours do I have left at this rate? You, you have no clue, no clue at all. Which I mean, I get if this is the layout that they came up with and there's just no way to change that, it's hardwired into this, but that's not supposed to be true because you should be able to get uh, software updates through the app. But even if they couldn't change this, why couldn't they change the app? The app says the exact same thing. 463 watts coming in, it's at 6%, 48 watts going out. Nowhere on here is the ability to say how many hours do I have left of either charging or discharging. And I think that's a massive flaw. And I've seen the app update. They used to have a different layout and they've updated it and they still didn't put in the hours left. And I think that's a huge um, miss on Blue Eddie's part. I don't understand. It's an app. Just change the data on the screen. Not that hard. Now, something that should be mentioned, there is a beautiful Blue Eddie app that I really, really do like. That's obviously if you're having that sun problem where you can't quite see this, I almost never use this touch screen to look at how things are percentage wise or what draw I'm doing. I almost always use the app and you don't have to reconnect it. It's done by Bluetooth. And every time I'm within range of this and I click on the Blue Eddie app, it's automatically connected. I've never had to reconnect it. So that's one good feature. Again, I'd use this before I'd use the screen. So if the sun is your issue, then that's what I would deal with is just do this. Also, when I'm sitting in bed, if I'm ever curious what the battery is at, I don't have to get up and go touch the screen. I go to the app, which I always have my phone near my bed. Another thing too is because I plan to put this beside my bed. You can hear the bing. Yeah, it charges your phone on top. There's two in case husband and wife want to both charge the phone at the same time. Again, on the screen, you can turn on and off the AC off, DC off, and uh, obviously it updates on your app as well. But if you're not using the DC or the AC, always turn it off because there is a little bit of phantom draw. Um, so if you're not using DC and you're only using AC, turn off the DC. It'll save a little bit of battery power. I don't find the draw too, too bad, but then again, I kind of always have solar and or other things charging it, so it's hard for me to know. I have looked at a few reviewers who say there is a bit of phantom draw, so if you leave it powered on, as you can see, it's on when the green light's here. If you power it off, obviously no green light. Then of course there's next to no phantom draw. It holds the power, but if you leave it on and then you don't use it, there's a lot of internal guts here that are constantly checking what's going on and that will slowly draw some power out of your battery. All right, let's go back to the outputs, you've got four USB-A, which again, maybe in a few years, that will be not really the norm anymore. Everybody's going to USB-C, uh, but there's four of them. Two are quick charge and two are regular. So those are there for all your plugging in your iPads, phones and whatnot. Then you have a full 100 watt USB-C. And then you think, well, 100 watt, like my iPad only takes 30 watts. You'll notice it if you're a laptop user, this MacBook, Pro uses 100 watts. Now, granted, you can charge it at 30 watts, it'll just take longer, but if you wanna fast charge your laptop, this is a full 100 watts. Then you have two DC out barrel plug type. 
and those are 10 amp. Then you have what's called like an aviation plug. So this is almost like a, like a shore power specified thing, an aviation plug, and this one's pretty big, 30 amp. So if you have something where there is an aviation plug, in fact, the aviation plug, to show you what it looks like, the input for your solar panels is an aviation plug. So it looks like this, it's got little two little prongs. I've never had anything that needs that, uh, and except for now this needs it, but that's there and it's a 30 amp. And then you've got your regulated cigarette adapter kind of uh, plug. So it is 10 amp and it's regulated. So that means regulated means the voltage will stay consistent. Uh, it won't fluctuate as the battery gets weaker. It always regulates it. So that way it's good. Cause there are some electronic items that just do not like having voltage spikes and up and down. So regulated is the way to go. So on the side, I'll zoom in so you can see it better, but on the side you have your barrel input for your AC power. That's what this black 500 watt one will go through. And then your input, which is that aviation plug for your uh, solar panels. And then two, which very weird looking plugs that is for those expansion batteries if you choose to get them. And again, you can add two more to this. So you'd have 2048 times three if you got two more additional B200 batteries or 200 or two times 3000 amp hour if you got the b300 batteries again you can add up to two more on top of what's already built into this now there are fans on the side that will come on from time to time if you're doing a lot of draw all at once they're not very loud i mean this, this thing is actually louder than the fans in this thing uh, but if you are in a very quiet room and you've got a lot of stuff going charging off of this you will hear a slight hum of the fan and it kicks on and off. Unlike this, it just seems to run constantly when it's plugged in. These only come on when the internals get a little bit too hot. Again, I don't find this, the fan noise from this to be obtrusive at all. I do find the fan noise on this to be a little bit louder than I would like. Okay, a little bit more on the charging options. It comes with a bunch of different charging potential possibilities. <laughs> Obviously the most obvious one that comes with is uh, MC4 connectors. Everything is connected through XT90 connectors. So you just choose which one goes into your uh, aviation plug. So the aviation plug goes in and then it's an XT90. From there, you can plug into this, which is your MC4 connectors for a standard solar panel connection. But you also have the ability, you have a plug that goes into a cigarette adapter, a, a XT90 cigarette adapter. So if you are trying to plug it into your car, that's an option. Also comes with a cigarette adapter uh, connector to a battery and believe it or not it's very easy that DC enhancer what it does is it will allow you to plug into a shore power or lead acid battery and get up to 500 watts if you don't have that you can still use these alligator clips to connect to a battery and it'll bring in a little over 100 watts without you having to buy anything extra which is kind of cool if like again you're in a longer term solar or longer term power outage, you do have some lead acid or some lithium iron phosphate batteries, and you want to add more capacity to your existing B200 Max without buying the extra batteries. That is something you can do right out of the box, which is nice. Okay, so my thumbnail will probably have something to do with how I don't need this anymore. You won't need something like this anymore when there's things like this. The technology has advanced so much. And again, there's like, a hundred different positives for having something like this over this in every way, smell, noise, fumes, just maintenance, oil changes, all that stuff. One thing I wanted to mention too, you know, people are going to ask, well, how have you used it? I've had this since um, October. It's now January, 2023. This says 3000 watt sign inverter. This is my inverter up from my boat. And one of the driving factors for why I bought this because I, I could have just added more lithium iron phosphate. A, I wanted mobility to take this with me. B, even with a 3000 watt sign inverter, now it's probably that inverter's problem. It had problems with things like buffers, uh, polishers, anything that's like a motor where there's like that startup thing. So if you want to run a bandsaw, you know, table saw or any of those type of things, you'll be able to do it with this no problem at all. Obviously you could do it on this too, but again, noise and fumes and all that stuff. I ran every possible thing I could think of off of this. I ran four sliced toasters. I, I put multiple things together. I obviously tried my buffers and polishers. Worked like a dream. This 3000 watt sign inverter, even though theoretically it should easily handle it, because actually this says 3000 watt, this says 2200 watt. This is supposedly a smaller inverter. This thing just couldn't handle certain things. It could handle things that had a kind of consistent draw, but anything that spikes at its start just wouldn't work. So that's why I went to this and I've been 
loving it. Again, if you buy something like this, you probably don't ever need to think about buying something like this. Chances are I have long-term power outage. <laughs> You know, in my neighborhood, when we had one that people were out for about a week, usually neighbors, friends, family, somebody has a, uh, a normal gas powered generator. If you had this, maybe with the expansion batteries, what you might be able to do is if you are running low, just ask if you could borrow this for a hour or two and you should be able to charge this right back up to full and get you through a couple more days of power outage. So there you go. I've tried it. I've used it. I've had it for months. I love it. You can also just save money even if you don't have a boat, cottage, whatever, doomsday prepper. If you just have this as a what if, or if you work from home and you need to have your computers and your Wi-Fi working, even during a power outage, this would be a perfect what if scenario. Uh, have it plugged in, use the power when it's cheap at night to charge it up, and then just use your computers and things during the day when power is expensive. And you'll probably get back some of the money you've invested in this just by charging it when it's cheap and using the power when it's expensive. So there you go. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode. I love technology like this. I really do. I get passionate about this stuff. So I plan to make a lot more videos like this than my sailing around Lake Ontario. Of course, when I was sailing across oceans on brand new catamarans, a lot of you love those videos and I got lots of views. When I sail my much smaller boat around Lake Ontario, much less views. I get it. You know, after a while, everywhere looks similar. <laughs> so I understand that, but I think a lot more people, not just sailors, will find electronic off the grid stuff, uh, entertaining, informative, whatever. And hopefully that's a direction I'll go with this channel more than just sailing around on my own boat. Granted, I'm going to be retiring in a couple of years, at which point we're going to sell the house and live full time on a catamaran. And I'm sure I'm going to be excited about our new catamaran purchase and just showing you how I'm so electrically minded and tech minded. My wife and I have pretty much said to ourselves, we will not buy a gas or diesel powered uh, sailing catamaran. We will only buy one with electric propulsion. And generally that means having a lot of solar on your boat and a lot of technology on your boat. So I'm looking forward to that new purchase in the future and I'll keep you up to date. So if this sort of stuff excites you or gets you interested, definitely subscribe to the channel, show the channel some love by giving it a thumbs up. And until next time, this is Craig signing off, wishing you safe cruising.